الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا My dear respectful brothers and sisters, I'm starting my khutbah right away uh, because I am trying to pinpoint several issues that within the time frame allocated. So, inshallah, I want to uh, show the explanation of this ayah. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَا وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ That ayah which is in Surah Al-Isra, ayah number 70. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, we honored the children of Adam. We blessed them with confidence and with the confidence on land and sea. We provided them with fresh and good food and good things. And we exalted them above many of our creatures. So in this verse, we see that the human being are the most important, the greatest thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created on the face of the earth. And because of that, then we know we are the best. And we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us to be in charge of the rest as he made us the Khalifa. So, to emphasize the key word of this ayah, which is karamma, we have honored, we honored that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I've given them honor and greatness, the human being. That we can understand many things from this verse. But let us stick to the point of human rights. In the Islamic system, there are human, there's human rights. Most of us may not know that Islam has human rights. And the Western and the International Conventions learned human, right, human rights from the Islam. So the fundamentals, or say the pillars of human rights in Islam are five elements. Those five elements are the life, the property, identity, mind and faith. Identity could be a familyhood, a nationality, or lineage. Those are the five pillars of human rights in Islam, which are more or less or exactly like that of the international conventions. Today, each of these needs to, to be discussed in separate lecture and it is a lot of talk, but I am focusing on one of them, which is the mind. The mind, whether you call it brain or mind focus or mind capacity, in Arabic it's called al-aql. So the aql, the mind, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in uh, all the almost many, many verses in the Quran. You can find how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizes the mind, the aql. In this one, I'm not talking actually about the mind, but I'm coming to one specific sub-subsection of the aql, which is, first if we put aql the mind, if we make it like a, a table, we can put, give it two legs. One of them is the mind in terms of health, and mind in terms of abuse. That the mind, uh, you, you should protect and preserve your mind, mainly from two things. Anything which is unhealth and anything which can make it inactive. Uh, so, or abuse. The health issue is very clear that you can see First, you know that these two, thing, do, these two harmful things in the mind could come in two ways. It can come from the person 
himself or from another person attacking him or her. So somebody can damage his or her own mind by himself. Like for example, consuming the, uh, the intoxicating substances, be it liquor or um, something solid or something which is air. If you use anything which it can make you drunker or can confuse your mind, then you, you will be asked in the day of uh, in the judgment day, uh, why did you abuse, why did you kill or damage your brain? So that is one way and many other ways that uh, including the many other things that can damage your brain. So you must protect your brain, that's one. The other thing is that it's the psychological warfare or what we can say that somebody does not use his mind or her mind but make it inactive, make it uh, something which is like handicap. So either you entrust somebody and just rely on what somebody else is doing, maybe on behalf of you, you expect that such kind of person will think for you, and, but you don't know if he thinks for you, thinking and making good and uh, uh, good things, and that you have first good things. But the one who is thinking is the one who is harvesting and taking that uh, good bounties. But now my topic is that there are many things that comes under the mind, uh, including the belief, the faith, and uh, the freedom of faith, freedom of speech, freedom of language, freedom of knowledge, freedom of decision making, and freedom of culture. Here is where my topic is freedom of culture. Where is the intersection between Islam and cultures? How Islam, is Islam preventing and destroying all the cultures existing before or it accommodates them and acknowledges them? This is what we, I want to emphasize today, inshallah. So the cultures, first of all, we I recite one verse in the Quran, which shows us how we deal with the cultures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah al rum ayah number 22, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim. Wa min ayati khalqu samawati wal ardi wa akhtilafu al-sinatikum wa al-wanikum. Allah is saying, among his signs, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, uh, and the signs of Allah, is that he created the heavens and the earth. And the other sign, another sign, he were, Allah was talking many signs and proofs and evidence, which are called ayah in the Quran. And that he created the earth and the heavens and he, the differences of your languages and the difference of your colors. And Allah is saying, Inna fi Indeed, that is a, a proof, an evidence for those who are, are knowledgeable. The knowledgeable persons can understand that. Here we see that Islam welcomes diversity, multiculturalism, multi uh, 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 say um, uh, behaviors which are not harmful to a human being and to Allah, uh, to uh, not affecting the worshiping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, how Allah um, first welcomes all the differences and colors for what? Because of that we learn lessons. We see the, uh, the, the strength, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is powerful and omnipotent, and he's, um, omnipotent, very powerful, and he's skillful, and he's the most omniscient. He knows everything, how to manage, and how to make, and how to make it run. That is one ayah we can learn from this, the, our differences. 
the other things that we should learn from each other. The other thing is that we should know to respect each other. Because if you are from like even one family living in one area, you may hate each other. But when you see others who, are, who differ from you in terms of color, culture, ideology, and all that, then you will see that there are many things in the world. And from there, the security and stability comes. Knowledge comes because we learn from each other. We learn from the indigenous knowledge and those who are most sophisticated and modern knowledge. So we can learn from different things and we can assist each other and we can strengthen each other, we can build up each other and we create a developed nation and higher community with, because of diversity. When there's diversity, there, where there's diversity, there's progress, there's development, there is any kind of progress, human progress. And that uh, you can start it from two, male and female. They have that differences of uh, the sex difference, they marry each other and they build a house. So you can, that is how we can learn by the difference to bring diversity together and make something up. How Allah, then let's see how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated with the differences of cultures and colors and languages and all that. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I was raised to perfect and complete the good cultures, good behaviors, ethics. This hadith is reported by Ibn Majah. So then you see Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not come to destroy whatever existed before him and did not come to intervene other people's affairs and what they are doing in their houses and how they dress up and how they walk and how they eat. But he came just to make corrections where there is a need of correction. And also to perfect that culture, to promote it and make it high. And Prophet Muhammad Allah says in Surah Al-Qalam, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلْقٍ عَذِينٍ And indeed you are in great and uh, ethics in great culture. Then uh, uh, the Sahaba radiallahu anha, asked Aisha radiallahu anha, what was his characteristics? And she said, Kana al Quran. His behavior was only the Quran. He was only practicing the Quran. So he was a Quran walking only. Whatever he said, whatever he did was based on the Quran. That is how we can apply the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through that way. So this system of building the good cultures and promoting it and uh, accepting is how Islam came to. That is the, that's one of the reasons of that Islam came for one thing, number one, to believe in one Allah and worship one Allah and then to build and augment the good characteristics. But we have here the five pillars of human rights. Anything that is harmful or threat or damaging in one way or another, these five basic human rights, that is the life, the property, the identity, the mind and the faith, is prohibited, forbidden and should be eliminated. Those could be cultures, could be individualist attitude. So in terms of culture, let me make an example of the cultures, the harmful cultures, which are harmful to human life and livelihoods and lifestyle. Those are, say for example, in, if I start from my background, where I came from, we have one of these cultures called FGM, female genital mutilation, which is to cut parts of a woman's 
and reproduction organs. And they will believe that it has a root in Islam. While it is completely opposite to Islam. So that is one of the bad cultures which should be uprooted. Say in sub Indian subcontinent. We have this culture in Indian subcontinent which is called honor killing. You know better than I know that honor killing. Last year it was recorded close to 400 women were killed in Pakistan only. And it came here in Toronto, you remember some years back, it happened. So that one is that harmful. Those are the things which Islam prevents and uh, it destroys. And again, okay, let me give you other examples. There are many examples, but you can see like, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, those who circumcise boys at the age of 10 or after 10, a kind of torture which is harmful to human rights, their lives and their dignity. And also, say, um, in the Hinduism culture, I observed that sometimes when there's a celebration in the temple of the Hindu, you can see young boys, 10, 15, carrying big carts with big wagons, which is full of idols worshipped as God, and they are dragging it, climbing the stairs to go to the highest level of the town. <laughs> so those things are harmful. Their person is dragging it with hooks. Hooks are hung on their shoulders and their neck, and they are dragging it. It's a torture. The other thing happens like in Africa, many parts of Africa, you can see people who have marks on their face. When they are young, their parents make cuts on their face, or they remove some of their teeth, or cut their ear and they say this can make them beautiful and attractive. That is human rights abuse and it's a torture. Those are the kinds of things which Islam prevents. What about other things which are normal day-to-day -day life? How to dress, how to eat, what to eat, what to dress, and how to socialize, public gatherings, how to communicate with each other, how to make marriage and dating and all that stuff. Those are the things which are very cultural and minor things and not harmful to any of the human rights. Those are called al-urf in Islam. Al-urf is a part of Sharia sources. The Islamic sources, making Islamic law, the sources number one, Quran, al-Sunnah, al-Ijma, al-Qiyas, al-Ijtihad, al al-Mursala, then al-urf. Al-urf comes, al-urf is how people behave, how they do their gatherings, how they do their kinds of social work, and those are the things, how they meet in the clubs, whatever, those are gatherings, and the things which are awful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered us to complete that. This is a part of the makarim al which for which Prophet Muhammad sallam came to complete. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-A'raf, which is also the A'raf, the Urfi, in ayah number 199, Allah says, Allah is saying, show forgiveness and mercy to the people and enjoy, enjoy good cultures and avoid uh, communicating and dealing with the uh, in ignorant way, but with the ignorant way. So it is al bil ma'ruf wa al munkar when we see that our comes. Therefore, here we see uh, nowadays in our lives, in our messages, in our societies, because many people came from different directions of the world, from different backgrounds and cultures and knowledge and whatever, we came together. And so which culture, culture should we apply here in, in the Western world? Should we apply only the culture of Medina and Mecca? Or we apply the culture in uh, India or Pakistan or which culture? So this is what we want to know. Islam, first of all, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in Mecca. When he was born, before he reached 40 years old, 
before he received the revelation. He used to dress just the, the way other people dress. He was using the same food, the same dress, and same, everything was similar with them. And when he got the revelation, he didn't make the revelation of clothing, clothing or dressing and that stuff. He didn't say, oh, this clothing was bad, you should not wear it again. Let's start a new culture. So he just continued the way it is. And let us put this into our mind, that Prophet Muhammad wasallam and his worst enemies, his uncle Abu Lahab and Abu Jah, they were wearing the same uniform, same dress. They were wearing this thong, and typically like anyone else. So there was no distinction between uh, the prophet's style of dressing and others. And when if somebody comes to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looking for the Prophet and see people sitting, he used to say, Ayyukum Muhammad, who of you is Muhammad? So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never singled out himself from the rest. He was just like one of them. He promoted that. When it comes to uh, the dressing, let, let me take another example. Based from my culture, where I came from, men who are religious, the righteous men, they wear something that is in Arabic is called izad, and it's, I think it's sarong, and possible life it's called sarong, and maybe in English. That sarong is a garment which is made like a skirt, a woman's skirt, and they put like this way, that's how they use. And it, I remember when I was young, when I came to masjid wearing trousers, Somebody said to me, your prayer is not accepted because you are wearing trousers, which is Kufari's clothes. So then, that was our culture. But I went to Malaysia, I have seen that cloth. They produce, the, they are the ones who manufacture it, and it is used by only girls, not men at all, completely. So it's like you wearing bra, if you wear that one, in Malaysia and in Indonesia. And then, if you look at West, uh, uh, West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, the clothes they wear, which is that big things to put together, in our culture, it is materially, colorly, and uh, structure, everything is for women, not for men. That's what the men of West Africa wear. If you come to Pakistan and you know the, what they wear, uh, everybody has their own uh, culture of dressing up. So this cult culture is, Islam is not bothering you to talk about this, how you dress and what you dress. As long as you cover your aura, your profit back is good, alhamdulillah. Regardless of the color you wear, the material, and whatever it is. But in nowadays, we, maybe it is, it's based on business that somebody says only this type of clothes you can wear. So that is uh, something which is actually becoming obstacle to our Islam and bothering us. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in terms of eating, one time he was brought to a meat, which is uh, alligator or uh, lizard. They gave him, they said, oh, eat this one. Then he felt that so come uh, somehow disgusting. He said, uh, well, it is not haram, but it's not our culture. So I'm not eating it, because it's not my culture, but it's not Arab, you can eat it. So it's about the culture. In some dresses, another example is that, uh, say the type of songs and these things, whatever, in, in our cultures, we differ. Take the issue of women, the position of women in the society. We know it is not hidden in Arabia, a woman cannot appear in the TV, cannot talk publicly, cannot talk to two people, cannot address any uh, talk in public, in, in this masjid or anywhere, and he cannot drive, cannot do anything, and you as a man, if you go there, you cannot mention the name. Be aware, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you cannot mention the name of somebody's daughter or wife. It is big crime there. You cannot mention her name in any way whether you know her or not. And then, in all those, that position, this is opposite to what is going on in 
Malaysia and Indonesia, where women are decision makers, active, productive, communicative, and the biggest part of the community. So these cultures, and some places you see, in the gatherings there are mosques playing, others it is prohibited because of the culture. And again, you can see, let's take one a hadith, that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one time what happened was that, Aisha radiallahu anha attended a wedding ceremony. So she was also accompanying the bride to, uh, in, order, in order to show the honor. And so she was there. She was for a while there. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was waiting her up in the house. And from there you can understand that he was in the house and she was in the ceremony body. And by that time, if they had young babies, he would be babysitting and keeping the house chores. When she came, he asked her this question, said, Ma min, min lahum. What do they have for, for fun, for entertainment, for musical instruments? What did they play? What did they have in that place? This hadith is reported in Bukhari and Ahmed bin Hamdul. And she said, no, they didn't have any uh, kind of that entertainment. Then he said to her, you, you would have played music for her because people of Ansar love songs. So songs and music and all are the same things and booters. So he said they love those the songs. So you could have played for them a song. Then you can understand how Prophet Muhammad was respecting the culture of everybody and welcoming it. It was not that somebody says my culture is better than your culture. So now we have this problem, which is that some people want to impose others, uh, to impose their culture upon others. They were saying my culture is the best. And many of us believe that as long as this person is Arab, his culture or their culture is better than our culture. That's what we believe. Where Islam is, because we're all human beings, we're all equal. All our cultures are welcome in Islam unless they are harmful to the human rights. Those, these are the things that we need to understand. Your culture, as long as it is, it is not bothering, you are not bothering other people and not transgressing to other bodies, other persons' boundaries of uh, human rights, you are right. And you are not, it's not affecting the, you are not worshiping something other than God. It is that way of having good things. When it comes to like songs and uh, making and poems and that, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked and he said, little little kalam, it is just a word, words. For Hassan wa Hassan, for Tabihu wa Tabihu wa Hassan wa Hassan. Which it is the good things that you, when you are singing the good lyrics, you say, it's good, but the bad ones are bad, and it's counted as bad. So the same thing applies to when you are talking. There's no difference. And the uh, Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it is bad, even if it is causing shirk, you should not attack them. You should not uh, insult them. You should welcome in the first place, entertain it, accept it, and then uh, you go inside, with, inside their hearts with love. And, correct them in a peaceful way. And for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تسب الذين يدعون من دون الله فيسب الله عدوا بغير علم That is Surah Al-An'am, Ayah number 108. Allah is saying, do not insult what they worship. That is the stones they worship. Do not insult it. So that they may insult Allah out of anger and out of ignorance. But talk to them in a nice cool way in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala